Good afternoon. Thank you so much, uh, Robert, for that incredibly uh, generous and well-researched introduction. It is such a pleasure to be here speaking with a live audience. I know these last two years have been so hard on all of us uh, and people who are watching and, and far beyond that. So thank you so much to my wonderful colleagues who are also fellows this year for venturing out of our offices to attend uh, this afternoon. And thank you too for the amazing miracle working staff who make researching and writing at the National Humanities Center such a joy, a gift we fellows will never stop appreciating. Now I'm afraid I must change registers as I dive into the subject that brought us here today and the light that scholarship in history, the humanities, and the social sciences can shed upon it. The attack on the U.S. Capitol on January 6, 2021 stands as the worst case of political violence aimed at the national government since the Civil War. I'd like to start my lecture with a brief video that captures it. I'm sure you all saw the news footage of the siege to prevent the certification of President Biden's Electoral College victory. But now that multi uh, recordings from multiple vantage points have been collected, it's worth reviewing again a brief, uh, a brief collection to recall just how fierce the attack was. The video is just over a minute, so only a sample of the four hours of what one House member called savage medieval style violence. The ferocity followed Donald Trump's rally outside the White House where he told the many thousands uh, who attended, if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. So here is the... We're going to throw this gun. We're storming the Capitol. Do you want your house back? Yeah. Take it! We cannot hold this without more munitions or more air power. I need to know some capital. Where do I want to pull back to? Mr. Pitt, we lost the line. We lost the line. We lost the line. We lost the line. The footage you just watched conveys the brutality of the attack and the resolve of the frontline militants. Right-wing activists who typically trumpet law and order and exalt the police showed no compunction about assaulting Capitol police officers with anything at hand. Fists, boots, metal barriers, lead pipes, sticks, baseball bats, crutches, and flagpoles, as well as bear mace and other chemical agents anything that could serve as weaponry to get the police out of the way so that the insurrectionists could get inside the building and stop Joe Biden from being proclaimed president. Once the mob of over 2,000 rushed the doors and broke windows and climbed inside, they roamed the halls chanting the names of Vice President Mike Pence and Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi while calling out death threats. They bore signs and symbols of America's long vigilante tradition, ever entwined with white supremacy. On the lawn, some erected a gallows to hang Vice President Pence. Uh, to hang Vice President Pence for defying Trump's demand that he refuse to certify the Electoral College ballots. One insurgent carried a Confederate battle flag through the rotunda an act of defilement never even attempted during the Civil War. Trump flags abounded, along with camouflage attire sporting right-wing imagery and slogans old and new. By the time the Capitol was finally cleared near dusk, five people had already lost their lives from the mayhem, 
and almost 150 police officers had suffered wounds or injuries. One would die later that night, and two took their own lives soon after. Damage had been done to the people's house that would cost many millions of dollars to repair. After the siege, the Capitol Police, deeply demoralized, lost more than 130 officers to resignations and mass retirements. Astonishingly, those restoring order allowed the overwhelmingly white group of protesters to leave the building without arresting anyone. Only in the weeks and months after the assault were the attackers pursued using video surveillance, cell phone recordings, and the boastful social media posts of many participants, often with tips from citizen sleuths who saw the posts or recognized faces in the crowd. To date, over 700 people have been charged, including leaders of the white power group, the Proud Boys, whom Trump had earlier told to stand down and stand by. Many more have thus far escaped accountability, above all, those most responsible for convening and goading the mob. It's true that Donald Trump underwent a second impeachment, this one for incitement of insurrection, with a masterful case mounted by House Democrats who voted unanimously to convict, joined by some courageous Republican colleagues in both chambers. That made this the most bipartisan impeachment of the four in U.S. history. But the overwhelming majority of elected officials in uh, Donald Trump's party took his side. Indeed, 197 Republican House members and 43 Republican senators voted against impeachment of the person who had just put their own and others' lives in danger. Thanks to them, he was not convicted because impeachment requires a two-thirds majority in the Senate. This leaves Trump as the only president in U.S. history to be twice impeached, and at least at this moment, still eligible to run for the office again in 2024. Evidence gleaned from journal through journalism, the impeachment, and ongoing investigations by a House Select Committee has made it inescapably clear that for Donald Trump and his closest allies, the storming of the Capitol was instrumental after two previous stratagems for overthrowing the will of the voters had failed. This then was political violence in its purest sense, force designed to achieve what could not be gained through the normal political process. It was unleashed to back a coup attempt that capitalized on ambiguities in the Constitution's provision for certifying elections to attempt to allow the loser of the election to defy the will of the voters and stay in office. With that summary to refresh us for orientation, let me turn to my core argument, which is that this was not a one-off episode, and it cannot be explained with attention to Donald Trump alone or social media, or other popular views now circulating. Indeed, to settle for such simplicity is to leave democracy profoundly vulnerable to smarter and better executed coup attempts in the future, not only in the United States, but given American power and standing throughout the world. I wrote those words before the invasion of the Ukraine. Instead, we need to understand that presidency and its climax in the attack on the country as the ghastly fruit of a four decades long campaign by a highly strategic radical right. That campaign included the use of disinformation as a political tool, the use of legislative and judicial rule rigging to undermine established norms of governance, and the weaponizing of tensions over race, religion, and sexuality to put voters on whom these political entrepreneurs rely in a state of constant fear, anger, and agitation. The deliberate cultivation of ideas, practices, and organizations designed to transform the nation set processes in motion that will be exceedingly difficult to arrest now if the architects of this calamity even wanted to. The most powerful and the most culpable show no signs of that, no remorse on a scale that might avert a successful authoritarian power grab in future. Rather, we are dealing with engineers who test prototypes and learn from misfires. 
In fact, I will argue, what the combined evidence highlights is that a particular highly ideological wing of corporate capital, one heavily and not coincidentally based in the fossil fuel sector, is so determined to shackle democracy to achieve their ends that they are starting to experiment with explosive tactics in the way their counterparts did in Italy in the 1920s and in Germany in the 1930s. We are seeing many corporate donors on the political right, among them some of the largest donors, turning a blind eye to violence used to intimidate opponents and enable their own securing of control over government. I'll elaborate on the who and the how and the why in a moment, but first I want to give a quick sketch of what has been learned so far by the House Select Committee charged with investigating the storming of the Capitol and explain how these preliminary findings point us back to a much deeper history that needs attention. Co-chaired by Democrat Benny Thompson and Republican Liz Cheney and featuring uh, Representative Jamie Raskin, a constitutional scholar as spokesperson, the committee has identified three concentric rings of activity. Three concentric rings of activity. The first consisted of a large outer ring of avid Trump voters who believed the big lie that the election was stolen from him. This group turned from protesters into rioters in the presence of a smaller militant middle ring. It was made up of hundreds of white power activists who had come armed, trained, and eager for battle. Then there was an inner ring of suited officials and advisors situated in the White House and beyond. Directed by Trump himself, this group's members strategized on how to throw out the election results. They exploited the anti-democratic potential of our federal system in hopes of changing the electoral college votes in swing states that he lost. Evidence has already come to light that this third ring, as uh, Jamie Raskin calls it, the, the, ring of the ring of the coup, counted on and depended on the chaos unleashed by the second ring and the wider crowd for their plan to succeed in creating the much needed delay. Trump inadvertently testified to the, that reliance in a recent speech in which he pledged that if he is reelected, he will issue pardons to all of those facing criminal charges for the events of January 6th. The case I will make today is that each of these three rings of activity is the product of decades of intentional cultivation before Trump ever came on the scene. And so they will remain if and when he leaves the scene unless they are exposed, understood, and held accountable. I want to discuss them in reverse order because the key players behind the snowballing uh, emergency of American democracy are the figures in suits, not those in the streets. As my 2017 book, Democracy in Chains, showed and subsequent research has elaborated, the crisis of democracy in the United States today is being driven in large part by a network of radical right corporate donors determined to remake the world to their liking. Organizations they fund have radicalized a major political party beyond recognition and cowed its elected officials into submission. I'll say more about that as we go. In turn, members of that party are encouraging vigilantism in multiple arenas, in word, deed, and even legislation in the states this party controls, now 30 of 50. Those states are causing what political scientists call, with a too passive noun, uh, the democratic backsliding of the U.S. Because this backsliding is not uniform across the country, but rather it is concentrated in states run by these radicalized officials who often both incite norm-breaking action and refuse to prosecute it. The inner circle around Donald Trump that strategized to overthrow the election was the result of groundwork laid over decades now with funding from the wealth, some of the wealthiest individuals in America, actually in the world, uh, above all, though not only, Charles Koch and the network of nearly 700 donors he has built. 
Charles Koch, for those who don't know him, has amassed a, for, amassed a personal fortune of over $55 billion, having built an inherited company into one of the largest privately held corporations on the planet with operations in 60 countries. The core of Koch Industries is fossil fuel refining, but it has branched into private equity, real estate, artificial intelligence, and more. Through it all, Koch sought ideas, a technology as he refers to it, for how to effect a radical transformation of society and governance that he, as a very smart man with three engineering degrees from MIT, knows to be something the majority would never agree to if they understood where it was heading. This project is so radically new in human history that the social sciences lack even a concept for its scope, audacity, and strategic sophistication. The Koch Donor Network funds an infrastructure of hundreds of ostensibly separate national, uh, uh, hundreds of ostensibly se separate organizations. At the national level, they include the Cato Institute and the Heritage Foundation and other think tanks the American Legislative Exchange Council, a corporate funded body that writes laws to be introduced and passed by Republican uh, state legislatures, uh, and the Federalist Society, which works to train right-wing lawyers and judges and secure seats for them in the courts. So too, it contains organizing enterprises such as Americans for Prosperity, Concerned Veterans for America, the Libre Initiative, which targets Latino voters, and Generation Opportunity to attract and groom young people. At the state level, the donor network funds over 150 organizations, including I believe it's four in our state of North Carolina, whose work is aligned through an umbrella body called the State Policy Network. And there are multiple outposts in higher education. The Charles Koch Foundation alone underwrites dozens of centers at colleges and universities, with the flagship campus being George Mason University, which I wrote about uh, in Democracy in Chains. But over 300 campuses now get some kind of funding from the Charles Koch Foundation. So we are talking about myriad organizations working through an integrated division of labor to radically alter government and society. To what end? A quest to bring unfettered, free reign capitalism into being without being honest with the people, and this is uh, some of the agenda. To achieve that, the Koch network has built the Republican Party to its agenda with a discipline that Joseph Stalin could have admired. Indeed, no entity has done more to turn the party of Abraham Lincoln, Dwight Eisenhower, and even George Herbert Walker Bush into the party of Donald Trump and his loyal MAGA faction, named after their Make America Great Again slogan and attire. How did they do it? For one thing, by funding primary challenges from the right against any Republican elected official who voted to raise taxes, support action on the climate, or who otherwise compromised with Democrats. I'll just give you one measure of the success of that strategy of primarying any who didn't toe the line. Uh, it's a strategy that Koch insiders boast of, calling it the accountability play, our secret sauce. By 2014, only eight of 278 Republican members of Congress would admit that climate change was caused by human activity. Eight of 278. While the end goal of the donors and the operatives is what I've come to think about as property supremacy, they call it liberty, but I think the record shows it's ultimately property supremacy, these actors have from the late 1950s to the present shown a willingness to leverage white supremacy, anti-feminism, nativism, and homophobia to win. That is to enlist and inflame popular prejudices to move a political economic agenda they know to be terribly unpopular and even unpopular among many of those who harbor such useful prejudices and will vote for these candidates. How has this cause, which was utterly marginal for decades, become such a powerhouse? After all, in the 1950s, movement libertarians numbered in the hundreds in the U.S., in the 1970s, in the thousands. 
Even today, polls find that only about 2% of respondents support the hard libertarian agenda, which wants government restricted to only three functions, to provide for the national offense, defense, to ensure the role of law, and to guarantee social order. For short, armies, courts, and police. They want to repeal, they want to get rid of the signature uh, voter-demanded public policies of the 20th century, such as consumer protection, income tax, uh, uh, progressive income taxes, social security, workers' rights to collective voice in unions, anti-discrimination measures, and environmental protections, to say nothing of privatizing public education and inheritance of the 19th century. Yet despite that fringe agenda, by 2016, this libertarian radical right had turned the Republican Party into a delivery vehicle for its agenda. Cowed by the donors on the one side and an aroused base about whom I'll say more on the other and backed by boatloads of dark money, newfangled Republicans won all three branches of the federal government, three-fifths of the state legislatures, and the majority of seats on the U.S. Supreme Court. It was not dark money alone that won this staggering power. Rather, I found in my research that what enabled this cause to go from that early marginality to its daunting dominance was a shrewd strategy derived from the school of thought developed by the first Nobel Prize winner in economic sciences from the U.S. South, James McGill Buchanan. Uh, founder of the Virginia School of Political Economy, which is a substream of the neoliberalism that flowed from the Mont Pelerin Society, with which many of you are probably familiar. To make a very long story short, Buchanan tutored operatives and the donors funding them, including Charles Koch, that if you don't like the outcome of public policy over a long period of time, you need to stop focusing on who rules and start thinking about the rules and how to change those rules to get what you want. Because if you operated within the existing rules, he explained, even elected officials who talked your talk would not walk the walk and make themselves unpopular by cutting programs that accounted for the vast majority of government spending and action. Things like Social Security, Medicare, farm subsidies, uh, veterans benefits, education, and more. In fact, history showed this to the strategist. President Ronald Reagan and George W. Bush proved the axiom. For all the talk of a Reagan revolution uh, and similar talk around George W. Bush's administration, they didn't carry through the radical libertarian corporate agenda. Deficits surged under both presidents because they wanted to spend, but they didn't want to cut. Hence the felt need to reset the game board with new norms, laws, and ultimately constitutional change. How? By writing new laws to break down collective power, above all, but not only, that of labor unions. By audacious gerrymandering to enable a minority party to dominate the majority of state legislative seats and the U.S. House of Representatives in positions so secure that the only threats they would face would come from more extreme members of their own party. In our own state of North, North uh, Carolina, Madison Cawthorn is an example of this uh, process in motion. Also, passing laws to suppress voting by the other party on a scale not seen since the dawn of Jim Crow. And by privatizing public goods from schools to roads and prisons so as to engorge corporate partners in the political project while fragmenting the public. The whole enterprise has depended on strategic disinformation, a strategy the Koch network used through a group called Citizens for a Sound Economy on behalf of tobacco corporations in the 1980s and healthcare corporations in the Clinton years and fossil fuel corporations for decades now under numerous organizations. By Greenpeace calculations, the Charles Koch Foundation alone has given over $130 million to organizations that spread climate denial and work to stop government action on the impending climate catastrophe. 
These donors and the organizations uh, they fund also litigated to win additional rules changes from the courts. One victory, Citizens United, opened the spigots to unlimited corporate money to sway elections. Another, Shelby County, enabled mass voter suppression. A third, Janus, aimed at the destruction of public sector labor unions. And the Supreme Court has declared the partisan gerrymandering, backed by this network's recipients, to be wrong, but beyond the ability of courts to stop. And while Charles Koch once called Donald Trump a monster, the Koch network used the Trump presidency to get a virtually immediate withdrawal of the United States from the Paris Climate Accords, three Supreme Court uh, appointments, huge tax cuts for corporations and the wealthiest Americans, and rollbacks of environmental, civil rights, women's rights, and labor protections, and more. To bring this discussion back to the insurrection of January 6, one of this network's core organizations supplied the ideas that the plotters, uh, that informed the plotters of the attempted coup, the Federalist Society. John Eastman, the chairman of its section on federalism and the separation of powers, produced the constitutional fig leaf and legal strategy for the attempt to declare the election results invalid. Others in the Federalist Society have produced a specious constitutional theory to enable state legislatures to refuse to certify the vote of the people and instead appoint electors who would install Donald Trump. Going by the name of the in independent state legislature doctrine, it is an extreme interpretation of states' rights under Article II of the Constitution that it is so extreme that it was long treated as marginal by even conservative legal scholars and judges. Its advocates claim states' power to appoint electors to the Electoral College enables them to prevent the counting of legitimately cast ballots if they see reason to do so. What the theory is designed to enable, in the words of one attorney working to defend American democracy, is, and I quote, legislative nullification of the popular vote for president. Trump Chief of Staff Mark Meadows circulated a detailed PowerPoint developed by such right-wing strategists, which specified uh, uh, detailed steps for Trump to take to hold on to power. Meadows, for his part, came to that position after chairing the House Freedom Caucus made up of the extremists the uh, Koch Network funds. You may also remember Jeffrey Clark from the final days of the Trump administration. He joined it after serving as the chief of litigation and director of strategy for the new Civil Liberties Alliance, an organization mainly funded by the Charles Koch Foundation to litigate against COVID restrictions and other forms of corporate regulation and individual regulation. Working together, Eastman and Clark led a trial run of this maneuver with seven swing states for which they sent the vice president alternate lists of electors. Vice President Mike Pence, to his everlasting credit, rejected the scheme knowing the Constitution did not grant him the power that Trump and his allies claimed it did. But here's a frightening future portent for 2024 and beyond. That independent state legislature doctrine has support from four members of the U.S. Supreme Court's conservative minority, I mean majority, whom the Federalist Society worked to get on the bench, with Brett Kavanaugh the most vocal of them. And that was before Trump managed to add Amy Coney Barrett. So that's the first wing of actors in this coup attempt, the suit-wearing network that had been cultivated over decades by far-right corporate donors. The second ring of key players in the events of January 6 was made up of members of the armed white power organizations, such as the Oath Keepers, the Proud Boys, uh, and the militias, who did much to get other people to Washington and to radicalize them by example and agitation once there, as I believe you saw a little bit of in the, the video. These groups also have deep historical roots in America, in their case, in America's tradition of white vigilantism. 
I'm not going to say as much about them and this tradition because this aspect has received much more attention from journalists and scholars. But the members of these white power groups came to Washington prepared and equipped for violence. They spearheaded it throughout the day as video footage, eyewitness testimony, investigative reporters, and prosecutors have shown. In short, they used force to do what Donald Trump and his team incited followers to do, stop the alleged steal. They did that physically by interrupting what for two and a half centuries has been the pro forma counting of electoral college votes by Congress. The plan capitalized on language lodged in Article II of the Constitution that when interpreted in a wholly new way could enable the coup backers to throw the election to the House for what is called, and very rare, a contingent election. A contingent election has different rules. In a contingent election, each state would have only one vote and Republicans with control over 27 state delegations to Democrats 22 could thus prevail. Then Donald Trump could call in the National Guard against anticipated protests. Virtually every aspect of these militant groups, language, attire, paraphernalia, and conduct echoed the long American vigilante tradition, which emerged from white settler attacks on native peoples, slave patrols, and post-emancipation extra-legal violence against African Americans and sometimes others. This tradition treated white Christian men as the supreme citizens, those Sarah Palin gestured to when she spoke of real Americans. It was this sense of entitlement that led mob leaders to attack Capitol Police officers, calling them traitors because these officers were themselves a multiracial force of women and men defending a multiracial democracy and Congress. As transnational research on the slide of democracies into civil wars has revealed, the trajectory of a group's political status is key. The trajectory. The political scientist Barbara Walter reports in her important new book, How Civil Wars Start, and I quote, people are, were especially likely to fight if they had once had power and saw it slipping away, as these white power participants in the events of January 6th did after the election of President Barack Obama. She also points out that the United States is predicted to be the first leading Western nation to transition to a non-white majority. Other researchers have uncovered what they found to be the one meaningful correlation to have emerged from studies of those arrested on January 6th, and I quote, insurgents were much more likely to come from a county where the white share of the population was in decline. That strong link, they reported, held up in every case. Some MAGA militants at the Capitol performed their sense of historic lineage, their desire to reclaim that standing by carrying the Confederate flag. Others hosted the Gadsden flag, which features a coiled snake ready to strike with the words, don't tread on me. This one originated in the American Revolution. Lately, it has been claimed by the libertarian right. Not coincidentally, it evokes an era in which citizenship was limited to white male property holders. So too, the right-wing insurrectionists at the Capitol summoned the horrible American tradition of lynching that claimed over 3,000 black lives at its peak by shouting, hang Mike Pence. Why? Because Pence had refused to abet their president's attempt to stay in power against the will of voters whom the vigilantes considered illegitimate, not entitled to decide elections. The mob seemed to show a particular venom for Democratic women leaders, above all Nancy Pelosi, whose uh, name they called out in the hallways in search of her and her office, which they ransacked and defiled. 
Also notable in the sense of entitlement the crowd's agitators felt was the strong showing of military and police personnel. Indeed, at least 14% of the uh, participants investigators have found uh, had a service record. Many were active duty police back home. As in earlier vigilantism by the Ku Klux Klan, which I studied in a previous book, the involvement of uniformed members of the agencies of government that monopolize force, armies, courts, and police, has historically conferred legitimacy on extra-legal violence, so vigilantes make special efforts to recruit such figures. At the same time, these individuals bring uh, crucial training in combat and sometimes stolen or purchased weapons, such as the batons and handcuffs several January 6th insurrectionists carried in the Capitol. All of these things work together to convey the message, not least to themselves, that the insurrectionists were the true Americans. Therefore, in their minds, they had the right to prevent the certification of Joe Biden as president since he was the choice of so many un-American voters in their view. They believed they had the right, uh, uh, indeed the duty, to ensure the continued rule of their president. Moreover, they have said in interviews uh, uh, since and court proceedings that they came on the appeal of their president who told them to stop the steal or lose their country. So that's the second circle, the seditionists who viewed themselves as restoring their rightful place as the people whose voices should count most. They also saw January 6th as a recruitment action and aimed to build their ranks from the outer ring, the largest ring of the three involved in these events. That third ring was comprised of avid Trump voters who believed the big lie and came out to do as the then president urged. The fact that they believed such a widely, <coughs> widely disproven lie, it is critical to understand, is in no way due solely to Donald Trump. On the contrary, they have been primed for generations in this susceptibility to trust purposeful disinformation. At the heart of the big lie is the axiom that the mainstream media is so biased and unreliable as to be irrelevant as a source of information. It's often assumed today that this axiom emerged with social media. Not true. In fact, the trope of the untrustworthy liberal media was first propagated by Southern segregationists seeking to discredit the black freedom movement of the 1950s and beyond. Later, in the 1980s, the donors I described and organizations they funded worked to eliminate the fairness doctrine in broadcasting, which they achieved in 1987. In the 1990s, they helped secure the deregulation of the telecommunications industry. These victories over accurate reporting of the news opened the floodgates to a right-wing media ecosystem that has made disinformation hugely profitable hugely profitable. The most prominent example, of course, is the media empire built by the now multi-billion uh, billionaire Rupert Murdoch, whose Fox News abetted uh, Trump loyalists at every turn, and also the rise of right-wing talk radio as personified by Rush Limbaugh and his imitators, who reach tens of millions of listeners each day. Media scholars have shown how this closed media ecosystem systematically misinforms its audience and agitates tribal reflexes. Critics have come to refer to it as the outrage industry for how it exists to cultivate a fearful and angry political identity and to provoke its audience to a state of high alarm. It makes the audience believe that they are under siege under siege from mortal enemies who look down on them and seek to hurt them and take from them what they hold most dear, their children, their churches, their gun rights, their country. After all, and this is crucial, human beings are wired in such a way that you cannot make most people into aggressors unless you first convince them that they are victims. Donald Trump 
understands this instinctively and uses it to his advantage, telling his followers when others have criticized him, it's not really me they're after, they're attacking you. Moreover, when you dehumanize those you see as a threat through the chronic use of eliminationist rhetoric, as the political right has done at least since the heyday of Newt Gingrich uh, in the 1990s, that makes some people indifferent to the pain they inflict. I urge you to look up the list of words that Newt Gingrich urged his party to apply to Democrats. It is no coincidence, too, that Fox targets a particular demographic, conservative white Christians, above all, fearful white evangelical Protestants who have become both the most reliable Republican voters and the most loyal Trump supporters. Thanks to, I could go into a deeper history, but I'm gonna skip it in the interest of time. Thanks to ardent cultivation by deep pocketed donors and the entrepreneurial religious operations they fund, including groups like the Alliance Defending Freedom, many of these white evangelical voters have crossed over into white Christian nationalism, having been convinced of three things. First, that the founders designed the United States to be a Christian nation, which is not true, but proved useful for the mobilization of large numbers. Second, that their God-granted dominance is under attack from hostile others. And third, that they are thus justified in seeking to establish dominion over government to keep others from taking over God's land. So deep is the tribal loyalty that the right has cultivated over decades now that polls a year after the insurrection found that 70% of Republicans believe the big lie. They believe that democracy is under threat from Democrats who are working to protect it. 57% now say they would never vote for a candidate who says Joe Biden won the election. A third approve of violence to achieve political goals. As the New York Times editorial board summed up the situation a year later, every day is January 6th now. So with that, let me turn to the second part of my title and the shorter part of my talk, the likely sequels of January 6th. How Republican Party officials have responded to the insurrection and attempted coup has ominous implications for the future because it shows us that one of the two major parties in the United States has rejected, in its majority, with some outliers, has rejected the truth and turned against democracy. After some initial condemnation, the day of the insurrection and in the weeks that followed, most of the party's representatives and its supporting media have turned to denialism and enabling. Uh, it has become a litmus test for a party that has stepped outside the constitutional order in the accurate uh, words of Representative Raskin. That is why instead of penance after the deadly debacle, we saw instead almost instant efforts to ensure that the next attempt at election sabotage could succeed. Recall that even after the barbaric attack on their workplace had driven members of Congress from the chamber to safe hiding, when they reassembled later that night, most Republicans still voted not to certify the election results. So too, Republican opposition to investigating the events of January 6 has proved near monolithic. They want to prevent accountability. Some of the most extreme even made light of the violence, saying it was, and I quote, merely a normal tourist visit. Only two Republicans uh, agreed to serve on the House Select Committee, one of whom, Liz Cheney, was promptly condemned by her state party and stripped of her leadership position. She now faces a fierce challenge from the MAGA faction of her own party. Adam Kinsinger, the sole other uh, uh, Republican on the committee, um, has already announced that he won't even try to run again because he knows he will lose. In February of this year, 2022, the Republican National Committee voted to censor both Cheney and Kinzinger, denouncing the investigation they were part of as, and I quote, persecution of ordinary citizens engaged in legitimate political discourse, end quote. 
So too, Republican legislators in 41 states have rushed to make sure a future coup can succeed by passing legislation to change how elections are run and by whom votes are counted and also to further suppress voting. Nearly two, uh, sorry, three dozen laws have been passed that empower state legislatures to sabotage their own elections and overturn the will of their voters. That's the words of the, the New York Times. Meanwhile, MAGA militants are running for the all-important office of Secretary of State in swing states that Trump lost so that they can be the ones to oversee the 2024 elections and decide the victor. Moreover, all of this has been accompanied by a tolerance for and even promotion of vigilante activity. National and state Republican uh, officials have turned a blind eye to rampant death threats to and harassment of election officials, both Republicans and Democrats, who recognize that Biden won. Because of this, the field of election supervision is hemorrhaging honest brokers. Uh, they have quit in droves. There has been no condemnation from leading Republicans of such attempts at intimidation, much less calls for prosecution. On the contrary, the party is moving into new terrain, normalizing repression and vigilantism short of injury and death. One key example is the expanding attacks on school boards, teachers, and curricula. Over the past year, Koch Network grantees and their Republican allies have found electoral gold in threatening educators and disrupting school board meetings to stop COVID mask mandates along with the teaching, with teaching and books that the right disapproves of. Again, far from condemning the in, uh, intimidation, often physical, of school boards, teachers, and even students, Fox News and Republican officials have goaded it. Uh, Republican state legislators have proposed and passed laws to punish teachers with huge fines, loss of licensure, even criminal penalties for honest teaching about racism in American history and life. It is now obvious that the election strategists see these battles as a way to drive turnout in 2022. Taking all of this together then, how serious is the potential for worse violence from the right in a future election? Three retired generals published an op-ed in the Washington Post in December to warn of a split in the armed forces in 2024 if civilian leaders do not hold accountable those who drove the insurrection and coup attempt and act decisively to fix the conditions that brought the nation to this point. These generals pointed to how more than one in 10 of those who attacked the country served in the armed forces and that Trump enjoyed public support for his big lie from 124 retired admirals and brigadier generals who called themselves flag officers for America. The three generals warned of, and I quote, the potential for a total breakdown of the chain of command along partisan lines in another insurrection like January 6th. In a contested election, they explained, some might follow the rightful commander of in chief, while others might follow the Trumpian loser. Under such a scenario, it is not outlandish to say that a military breakdown could lead to civil war." End quote. Sounding a similar alarm, a retired army colonel pointed out to me that the 400 million guns in the United States are concentrated in the Trump belt, which encompasses the states of the former Confederacy, along with parts of the Inner Mountain West and Midwest. In a nutshell then, if we don't reckon with the deep historical roots of the storming of the Capitol on January 6th, these events could turn out to be a prologue to a far worse outcome in the future. What might such a, uh, that look like? Here's a plausible scenario. After the defeat of the 2021 effort, the well uh, funded strategists in suits devise a more effective plan. As it unfolds, the white power insurgents 
supply the firepower to cause violent pandemonium that can be used to justify an authoritarian clampdown. And the mass of disinformed MAGA voters applaud the combined action for saving the country. Then the Supreme Court's six to three right-wing majority approves all of this as in keeping with Federalist Society constitutional theory. Think such a thing is impossible in the United States? The expatriate Russian journalist Masha Gessen was asked a few years back what her U.S. readers could learn from her work on Vladimir Putin's Russia. That's easy, she said. Never assume the worst can't happen. What I hope I have conveyed today is that we are seeing the emergence of a playbook that can be adjusted to new circumstances and adapted to different settings. Indeed, the disputed 2020 election, capped by the events of January 6, coming as they did on, a heel, on the heels of a decade of voter suppression, helped render the United States an imperiled democracy, according to the 2021 uh, Global State of Democracy re report issued by the Stockholm-based Institute, International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance. No longer does the United States rank alongside Canada, Costa Rica, and Japan with a 10 plus rating on democracy measures. Now it is down to a score of five and deemed a backsliding democracy. That puts the US in the company of Hungary, Poland, and Slovenia as countries that are undergoing what the Institute calls concerning democracy declines. In short, the evidence now amassed points to a disturbing conclusion for the United States and other embattled democracies. As Barbara Walter notes in that book, How Civil Wars Start, the risk commences as societies slip down the democracy index. As the rule of law weakens, as voting rights are curtailed, and executives face fewer constraints, a country's risk for armed conflict steadily increases. To return in closing to the three circles of complicity in the insurrection at the Capitol, it seems wise, in fact imperative, to anticipate their reassembly in 2024. The inner suited circle of the coup is already purloining power to achieve more control at the state level in the 22 22 midterms and in the courts. Now, in the wake of the storming of the Capitol and what followed, they know that they can count on the white power right and the militant conspiracy believers to step in with force if needed. And both groups have seen that the MAGA faction of the Republican Party is ready to believe such a pincer's action of elite donor strategy from above and street action from below is needed to save their country. These are dangerous times indeed. They lack the pitched class conflict of the 1920s and the economic depression of the 1930s, yet they feature new accelerants, a global corporate radical right, the capture of once establishment parties, impending climate catastrophe, and craven social media moguls. History never repeats in quite the same way. But we have entered a startling transnational downward spiral, unless, unless believers in democracy recognize the immensity of the threat and combine to outsmart, outvote, and even better as never before, the lethal militant minority project behind the events of January 6th. Thank you. Thank you. I know, it's a lot, as my nephew <laughs> likes to say, uh, but I think it is really important that we grapple with um, the evidence that, that uh, has come to light, particularly since January 6th. So anyone like to ask a question? I think I see Julie, maybe. 
And please, I guess, just come up to the mic, right? If you can line up behind the mic if you'd like to ask something. Um, I do have a longer comment, which I'm not going to make so other people can talk. So you've laid out with extreme clarity why this is an extremely concerning, disturbing moment. What do we do? The all-important question. Thank you uh, for that. Well, I, I am uh, relieved to report that many, many good people in many, many domains are recognizing this emergency and trying to act. Certainly the House Select Committee understands the gravity of what has happened and they're collecting evidence. They'll soon, I think later this month, in a few weeks, begin uh, doing public hearings that I think will be of interest uh, to all of us. There are also many uh, organizations that exist to protect democracy. In fact, one of them is called Protect Democracy and brings together people from different domains. Uh, and one of the things that has been most um, uh, energizing and gratifying to me since Democracy in Chains came out is um, invitations from the whole spectrum of, of organizations who would be alarmed at this, you know, including good government groups like Common Cause, labor unions, community organizing networks, civil rights groups, women's groups, environmental groups, foundations, you know, I could go on, but lots of people are really seeing this. And ironically, it's kind of one of those unintended consequences situations, I think, that the election and the presidency of Donald Trump awakened so many people to the need to, as John Lewis says, not think, said, not think of democracy as a thing, but a practice, a practice to which we must all uh, be committed. So you saw the growth of all the indivisible groups uh, and groups like those, many independent women's groups, um, uh, not, not exclusively women, but it, it, women are a lot of the volunteers, like uh, Chapel Hill has a wonderful group called Neighbors on Call that's done a terrific job um, registering voters, informing voters about uh, state matters in particular. Uh, so there's a lot going on there. I also want to say, too, since we're educators, that there's an incredibly important new coalition um, that has come together, a national coalition called Learn From History, uh, that is addressing these threats to teachers and the schools that we're seeing from the right. So this organization, Learn From History, they have a website where you can find materials to download for parents, teachers, um, school support staff, and students who are playing a leading role in some of this because they want to learn the truth about history. But I'm really really pleased to say that all the major historical associations um, that address American history have focused on this. The American Historical Association has been in the lead, Organization of American Historians, and many, many others. So that's something that educators, I think, can also take up because it is starting to come to some of our schools uh, in this area. So, so there is lots happening, but there are nowhere near enough people engaged in working on this in order to combat the, uh, to surmount the levels of voter suppression, for example, it will take huge turnout uh, in the 2022 midterms and the 2024 elections. I know I have probably terrified you with some of this, but I want to say too that the experience of 2018 and 2020 showed us that when voters really understand the stakes, pretty amazing things happen. And democracy reform won in 2018 in every state where it was on the ballot with some kind of a referendum. So I do think there's lots of hope, but um, you know, as they used to say in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, we need many more hands on the freedom plow. <laughs>